Well, good evening, everyone. Croesuwe Kinesiad Kennedy for Cymru, Aki Apirad Heno, and the Olchenvar am Dod. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the Peerhead this evening for what I hope will be a robust discussion examining the evolving role that Wales's flourishing hyperlocal movement of community and citizen journalism is playing in reflecting the views of and engaging with communities across Wales. First, I would like to thank uh, particularly those who have agreed to chair tonight's round tables. Thank you very much. You're smiling at the moment. I suspect you may not be smiling quite so much by the end. So the failure of a large section of the UK media and some of the Welsh media to properly report Welsh political life, and in particular, the work of the National Assembly for Wales, is leading to a gap in knowledge about Welsh political life. Now, many people in Wales access news through UK media platforms that fail to reflect the huge policy differences in public policy to their Welsh audiences. It means many in Wales are therefore unaware that our schools and hospitals, for example, are governed in a very different way to England. Now, this session follows on from one that we held last month, where we invited leading figures from the UK and Welsh media to discuss the issues. The discussions in that ses session centred on the UK media's role in covering the Assembly and the responsibility of Assembly members to make that business as inter interesting and relevant as possible. Now, Peter Riddell, the former deputy editor of the Times, also suggested that Wales needs to look to new media platforms and social networks to fill that gap. So tonight, I want us to move the discussion towards those, uh, those comments that Peter made and beyond the traditional media streams and explore what role the hyperlocal community could and should play in plugging what I think is a deficit. Now, there are some in the audience tonight already playing an active role in community-based initiatives, and I would like us to explore their viability in the long term and ask what steps the Assembly should take to help galvanise more people to become active local citizens. Now, the session will take the form of a round-robin round table, uh, which I have not heard of before, but it's a round-robin round table discussion, each lasting about 15 minutes, and at the end of which a bell will sound and the, chair, the chairs, not the physical chairs, but the actual chair people, <laughs> will actually move on to the next table. Now, each chair will be looking at a specific subject area in which they are leading figures. And you, as guests, will have the opportunity to engage in discussions about each subject area. And the four areas are digital media, hyperlocal newspapers, including Papurai Brow, Bro, community radio and local television. I look forward to a frank exchange of views which will be drawn together by our roundtable chairs who will sum up at the end of tonight's proceedings. So our intention is to share the outcomes of both sessions with you, which will provide us with a foundation for a report on how the National Assembly can work with all sections of the media in Wales to encourage more people to become active citizens. For those of you who wish to tweet about the, the event, the hashtags are on the tables, and I believe on the holding slide behind me. Now it's time to start those discussions, and I will pass you over to your chairs, and they are Bob Walker from Radio Turquoid, Richard Gurner from Caffili Observer, Ken Smith from the Port Talbot Magnet, and Bryn Rob Roberts from Cardiff TV, and Carl Morris from Native HQ. So it's over to the chairs. I hope you have a very interesting evening, and I do look forward to seeing the final report. Jochen Bauer. Um, so we were, we were looking at the issue of hyperlocal news provision, both online and newspapers. Um, I think a couple of things really were, you know, that we stressed that hyperlocal is perhaps a bit of a misnomer. It's really reinventing local newspapers. It's recasting local news provision um, and filling gaps where basically gaps have occurred and where big organisations have uh, basically pulled out of news coverage in towns, and there's different models. The Caffili Observer and the Port Talbot Magnet are slightly different models, but have got lots of similarities as well in terms of started off online, went towards a print publication, and um, you know, are looking at uh, 
diversifying further. I think the, the going round the tables on the speed dating revealed a number of recurring themes, which I think were interesting of, in the sense of what was the journalistic ethos of local news? How do you make sure that you're engaging with the communities? How do you get them to respond to issues of politics, of the assembly? What is the democratic deficit in that sense, I think, is an important issue. Um, is it about what's affecting them right in front of their faces? Or is it about the broader, bigger issues? And I think the general conclusion was that it's what's on people's doorsteps are the issues that they want to engage with first and foremost. But at the same time, the issues that come up in the Assembly through the Welsh Government are very important as well. But you need that local news filter to make it relevant to explain, to assess the impact on people in local areas. One of the things that came up in one of the sessions is that we've used in Port Talbot, and it will be going out to other organisations with Cardiff School of Journalism, an application called Little J, which allows the community to participate more in providing news um, and so on. Another question came up was, is print the answer? Is re-establishing print outlets going back a bit? Is it, are we just harking back? Are we dinosaurs because we started off as print journalists? But I think people feel that it's a way, you know, there's different audiences. And we're not saying that any particular way is the absolute answer at this moment in time. The whole industry is in flux. Um, but the point is that you can cater to different audiences through different outlets. And both publications, the Caffili Observer and the Port Talbot Magnet, use online, they use social media, and they also use print. But I think particularly from the point of view of creating a sustainable business, uh, print is a more effective medium, uh, particularly in linking up to advertisers. I think everybody in every session said, well, you've got a real challenge of how do you keep it going and how do you measure the impact that it's having in terms of addressing issues about the democratic deficit, but also in terms of things like the health and well-being of local communities. Yes, you're closer to the audiences, but are you helping them? Are you engaging with them? Are you making an impact um, with, with those audiences? Um, I think, in conclusion, um, we realise there's still a long way to go. Richard, for the Caffili Observer, and myself for the Port Talbot Magnet, we wish each other the greatest of success. We've got different models. One's a social enterprise, one's a sole trader. But we think it's a better model, in a sense, rather than the, what has happened where the big organisations have effectively deserted towns, that they've left them news deserts where people don't have the information. But also then, in terms of addressing the democratic deficit, the bigger organisations like the BBC, like national newspapers, have nowhere to feed from if you don't have a thriving local news organisation. I was here for the event on the 23rd of May. I think Kevin Maguire, for me, summed it up on one point where he said, cherish your local newspapers, cherish your local news outlets because you'll miss them when you're gone, when they've gone. And I think that's certainly been the experience in places like Port Talbot and Caffili. And that's why we need to see you know, and give encouragement to organisations like the Caffili Observer, like ourselves. There are lots of very practical issues where organisations can help. I think, um, again, I'm speaking personally here, this didn't come up in the, uh, any of the sessions, but certainly as a group of seven creatives, if you want to put it that way, of seven journalists, getting to grips with doing business planning, finding out where we could get money. Um, we spent a year banging our head against a brick wall with lots of things, and there's lots of information out there. There's lots of support out there, but I think the Assembly could play a big role in bringing that together to make it easier for people who are taking initiatives on the ground actually to get up and running, uh, rather than, fa you know, because, again, I think in the, the last uh, table we went to, uh, one of the people on it said, you know, hats off to organisations like the Caffili Observer Port Talent, because it must take a lot of effort. You know, it's a very <coughs> tough market. And it is quite tough out there, but you know, at the same time, people want to see the provision of news in local areas continue. And I think that's basically a summary of most of the points. Can somebody be more specific uh, about what you think the, the Assembly as an institution could do to help? Because obviously it's a sensitive issue, a political institution being involved in any form 
uh, of news? I mean, what realistically, in practical terms, do you think the Assembly as an institution could do? Shall I kick off on that? I think there's a couple of things. I think um, what I was hinting at earlier is that I think the Assembly could be a facilitator to help local organisations get established, um, you know, in a sense of helping overcome some of the barriers to entry in that sense for them, not a direct funder. I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down that road. I think it brings certain complications. But, you know, all news organisations have some form of public funding to one degree or another, whether it's newspapers, you know, in terms of uh, the VAT and, and uh, things like public service notices. So I don't think there's necessarily a level playing field in that sense, and that could be looked at. But I think more importantly, um, in terms of news, of assembly stories, then I think... Um, it's got to be a case of breaking it down to the localities and making it relevant to localities, you know, so that it moves away from process and what people see is the technicalities and the debates, but towards impact. And the more the Assembly could do that, I think the more that they're likely to get coverage, you know, so that basically all the organisations we're talking about at a local level are pretty much shoestring organisations. They haven't got the time to do the research, to do the backstory. So the more that can be provided of that, I think it will be an assistance. It wouldn't necessarily get in, you know, unedited, but it would definitely be an assistance. I mean, one of the things that came up in what, on one of the tables was uh, quite a strong view that basically that there shouldn't be local council newspapers or propaganda sheets, um, you know, uh, because they're not covering the news effectively, that they're putting forward a spin on a story. I mean, that's a big discussion, big question. But I think the other side of it for me is that, um, you know, if there was a provision of a news service through the assembly, working with local newspapers, making people available as well on stories, that would particularly help. You know, I know there is, but it's more getting the channels you know, meeting each other. Any other questions? Any other points? North Wales member, sorry, North Wales member living in North East Wales, and particularly in North, North East Wales. Yes, we have a very good relationship with our local papers. All, virtually all the AMs are pushing our press releases and bombarding them and frequently being given phone calls to, to give comments or, or what have you. Um, but press releases issued by government ministers other than the first minister or by shadow ministers or party spokespeople uh, who don't represent that area generally don't get in because they're not seen as local whereas if it was Westminster the minister for or the shadow minister for roads or housing um, w we would probably get in because it was recognized that the things they were saying or doing impacted on local people uh, so how are we going to cross that bridge so that local papers in Wales recognise, yes, we want to know what our local representatives are doing, but also we need to know what decisions or dialogue is happening between ministers and their opponents and the other parties um, in Cardiff in the name of your readers. Could I, could I just make one quick point on this? And I know Matt's desperate to get us off, because I was here on the 23rd of May, and um, the people who came from London gave the Assembly members a kick in, <laughs> to put it bluntly, and said, you're not interested enough to cover. Um, and I think that was too one-sided. I think there are faults there, but I think at the same time, it's up to us as journalists as well to get to what is interesting and actually report what's interesting and also probe on what's interesting for people. You know, we've got to be the eyes and ears of the community, effectively, and that means holding people to account. It means looking at the detail. The reason, one of the, one of the reasons that isn't done any longer, either at local news level or national news level, it's because the resources aren't there. There aren't the journalists there to do it um, because of the cutbacks that have been made by big national organisations. And I think, you know, that's what we've got to try and do is create a model where local journalists are there in sufficient numbers to be the eyes and ears of the community and to translate not just the process of something at the Assembly but what the impact of it is locally because people still are interested in that. And you need a robust debate. <laughs> you need robust coverage. Um, it's as simple as that. You know, I don't think you can escape that. I'm going to apologise to start with because um, I think less than half the time was used to discuss the democratic deficit because 
because we're not on air yet, I think more people were asking about what we're going to be doing um, generally uh, when we go on air in November. Um, so uh, just to say that we will be providing an hour news per weekday and half hour news on a weekend and there will be one current affairs program uh, per week. Um, it's inevitable because uh, the assembly is responsible for things like um, education and health uh, and transport that we will be carrying stories that are relevant to Cardiff. Um, we're going to be uh, unashamedly Cardiff centric. Uh, so we'll, um, but nearly everything that's discussed in the building uh, to my left um, will involve Cardiff people in one way or the other. Um, it's important that we make it uh, as exciting as possible because uh, I think the discussion that we did have was that politics, people generally find politics boring. Um, so it's, it is difficult to, to engage the audience um, in, in uh, watching something that, uh, that they don't particularly ha have an interest in. So it means presenting it in a way that will uh, appeal to them. And, and things like if there's a problem with A and E at the University Hospital in, in, in the Heath, then that's the kind of thing that, that will be uh, carried by Made in Cardiff when we go on air. Um, I was asked earlier on, I was interviewed by, by Radio Wales um, about this uh, pre-recording uh, pre um, and they were saying, well, how do you make uh, the assembly more sexy uh, for television? Um, difficult one, I think. Um, going back to um, the uh, previous meeting here on the, on the 23rd of May um, when Peter Knowles from BBC Parliament said, you know, assembly members working on their laptops, and we know they're working, um, don't seem to be engaged with what's happening. And if they don't look to be engaged, why would the viewer at home feel uh, engaged with, uh, with what's happening? You know, I discussed this with, with some people last week uh, and explained, well, at least they're there. If you look at Westminster, they're not even in the chamber. Um, so uh, I think that's a plus as far as the assembly is concerned. Um, one of the uh, one of the issues that we will have as uh, made in Cardiff is um, the uh, other uh, democratic deficit, which is uh, local uh, councils. I mean, we will be reporting probably as much on issues that county hall uh, or sit city hall um, will be covering as much if not more than the assembly um, but then uh, we will we will definitely be covering the assembly and it is going to be an extra outlet uh, for the assembly uh, i mean cost wise uh, we uh, uh, put things in in perspective we have uh, the same budget for the year as S4C has for a week. So you know, we have to make things work um, in an easy way um, so that we do cover the, the assembly issues. Um, what else was that? Uh, the, the other thing that we will have um, is second screen. So we will be able to offer things that maybe we won't be offering on our main programs through the second screen and through links to issues that the assembly will want uh, to pass on to, to the public in Cardiff. Um, I think that's more or less it. Um, I mean, it's gonna be a real challenge for us, um, but we're looking forward to it. Um, I, th I think we did, did discuss that on one, one of the tables. You know, that, that it's, I think it's, it would be a very good thing that there is cross fertilization between um, 
Now, insofar as that we are Cardiff, uh, I don't know how, how we would be able to do anything with Port Albert. Um, Carfilly is in, um, in the area that we will be broadcasting, uh, but we will be, I mean, we are local television uh, and not regional television, and therefore we will be Cardiff. But you know, similar kind of um, publications in Cardiff, uh, we, we may well be uh, wanting to join up. And we were talking about you know, community journalism in, in Whitchurch, and, and I, I know there are other parts of Cardiff. Um, then we will be wanting to talk to, to people. And, and somebody was talking, or you were talking about uh, training uh, people in uh, community journalists uh, and you know, so that, that we get involved with, with people that, that want to offer um, stories. So Mark O'Callaghan, uh, head of News and Current Affairs at BBC Wales. It's not really a question, it's just a, 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 a counterblast, really, to, to, to some of the things that I've been hearing. I, mean, I think it's a real mistake uh, to, to say and accept that politics is boring. I think in terms of uh, people, um, the general public, um, they might, or are you interested in politics? If you frame the question that way, they might just say, no, not really, you know, uh, I don't take much about it. If you frame the question differently and say, are you interested in your children's education? Are you interested in health? Are you interested in, in the economy or how much you get paid? You'll get very different answers. And I think, you know, the job of uh, the media at whatever level is to kind of uh, be creative in, in, in how we go about asking those questions and, and looking for those answers. And certainly with, you know, the assembly, you know, there's, there's powers here which affect people's daily lives in terms of health, education, and the economy. And that's why it's important. And I think uh, at the local level, I think it's probably true to say that, um, you know, um, even an organization which is pretty well resourced like BBC Wales cannot be on every street corner. So there is a, a question to be asked of councils and who are going to ask those questions, which, which is why I think the you know, the local debate is, 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 is so alive and so important because I think lots of newspapers perhaps um, don't do uh, that. I mean, I'm old enough to, to have started on newspapers and, you know, the diet for me in the Midlands was, was you, you covered the, the local councils and that's where you got your stories yeah. from. And it's, it's, it's just incredibly important. And I think just to um, downplay the relevance of it and how it kind of is a, a touchstone for people's lives w would be a mistake. So I, I think, you know... Uh, your outfit when it gets going is really rich with opportunities and you know if you, if you just go out and ask people what yeah. they care about they care about uh, their bins and when they're going to be collected and you know and, and how things work and I, I think you know we've got to be quite creative in how we we sell the issues yeah, I, I, I do think it's there to be done no I think it's you know, doing items which have uh, which are political issues but people will have watched it without realizing that it is a political issue uh, we were talking about uh, an issue with schools in, in Whitchurch, and I was talking with a councillor about um, building uh, houses on school fields in Llandrymony. Uh Now, uh, that's a story that maybe the person at home doesn't realise it's a political one, but it is certainly an issue for them. Okay, well, uh, thanks all for listening to me stuttering and umming and ahhing. Um, through my um, presentation. Um, being uh, the face of uh, community radio normally isn't my forte, um, but I've been delighted uh, to be able to um, put our views forward. I think one of the things that um, came up on every table is how many people listen to your radio station, how many people listen to um, community radio. Difficult to say. Um, community radio can't be part of the organisation which monitors radio stations um, called RAJAR um, because we're too small um, and um, it doesn't fit with um, Ofcom's ethos. However, uh, for my own radio station, um, we have um, between 7 and 50 listeners online a day 
and about 2,000 pounds, uh, 2,000 pounds, 2,000 um, listeners on FM. Um, for myself, we'd, we would be delighted um, to give the Welsh Assembly Government a higher profile on community radio. Um, I think they do a very good job uh, for Wales. Um, if you um, um, are in England, um, or the uh, government, uh, national government in England, I don't think they pay too much attention uh, to Wales. Um, so therefore, um, uh, other organisations um, have to do it. Um, so it's great to meet you all. I was look, we were looking for ideas and models in the fields or fields of social media. And there are a lot of enterprises and lots of people in this room that are enterprising and innovating in the f digital field in order to report the news and to report local news particularly and the variety of media such as the radio and bl online blogging, online news and there are campaigners, experts in various fields such as health for example or education, local groups and beyond and of course people in the mainstream media, media journalists such as BBC journalists who take advantage of the digital media to make to elements of their work so it is a huge field really perhaps we didn't really have time to delve deeply into these various issues but I can put forward some of the ideas that emanated from our discussion the digital media mainly companies mainly in America and Silicon Valley promise a lot of poss in terms of possibilities and potential in the digital media smaller voices can have a wider audience and there's quite a lot of hype around it, I would say. The question is whether people see specific examples of the use of the social media in Wales that raise awareness of the work of the Assembly. And the government, the Welsh government, is also accountable to us as citizens. Do we really get to see or do we, are we reaching that full potential within social media? And I doubt, I'm not sure whether we do really, whether, whether we really are realizing that potential and whether we're really taking full advantage of the social media when you think about the media, the, the hype that comes out from Facebook and YouTube and so on. So there's also a variety of players in this field. Some who's talking about research was saying that around 53 of 60 AMs do actually use Twitter. But also there's a question regarding whether they are interesting enough or whether they're attractive enough for the people on the street or whether, do they, whether they just actually appeal to experts and the geeks who do take an interest in world politics already. There was a suggestion as well that there are councillors, particularly councillors in Cardiff, who provide quite good examples perhaps, or set quite a good example for AMs, and there may be lessons to be learned or take on board. Uh, in Cardiff Council particularly, one idea in particular came out regarding a news enterprise by a news initiative by the assembly. Now perhaps there, there's a slogan or something that people say quite a lot in terms of social media or digital media that any company or some com can go directly to their audience. And there's no competition really between initiatives such as that and mainstream media or mainstream news, we want to strengthen the ecosystem of news in Wales. And newspapers 
can live side by side with independent initiatives. And the idea was perhaps the assembly, as well as press releases and the work that they carry out through the mainstream or traditional media, perhaps they should also consider some sort of paper or news initiatives that talks in the life in the language of the people of the street, telling people about what's going on in the assembly. And we, it is to be expected that there's a tendency in the report, in the, or that there's bias in the reports that put forward, but maybe we can share what goes on in the assembly in a more accessible manner. There's quite a lot of people as well saying that they know our boundaries between the different media, really. There are BBC journalists and the newspaper journalists who take advantage of Twitter to undertake research or to find sources. And there's no boundary between Twitter and the TV when people watch program, news programs or have I found in various um, news programs, there's a conversation often on going above or under the on-screen discussion via social media. So that does affect the way that professional people do access news and research into news and also gives opportunity to distribute more effectively. Somebody said that Twitter has provided a platform for some ministers in the Welsh government because the media at the UK level can actually see, for example, that Leighton Andrews is talking about a particular subject or issue and then they can go directly to him if they want to report stories from Wales. So there's an opportunity there to try and perhaps facilitate the process or provide a bridge between Wales and the media, the UK media that is, that are supposed to represent us as well, of course. Also, there were some suggestions regarding what the Assembly could do and organizations as unions could do to try and facilitate the news. As trying to deal with the problem of lack of or news def deficit. One of those is training. Somebody from one of the unions said that it would be possible for people in local communities, anyone can go on courses to learn about things with journalists and to use the lessons learned and the understanding gained to do a better job. And also talk about open data from the Assembly. I am aware of the fact that the Assembly does publish the record of proceedings at present in files that are accessible to people who want to analyze that data and try and find various patterns and try and analyze the discussions that take place in the assembly within the record. But perhaps more of that data could be shared through an open license. That's a possibility. And by the way, the journalist in the Western Mail who's a data journalist and she is an expert in analyzing all the data who come from bodies like the assembly. And also just in terms of the relationship between the media, people are talking a lot about the relationship between the mainstream media and the digital media. And it strengthens the role of professional people who analyze the stories and the experts, hopefully. Often things happen on the street or in communities, first of all, and they filter through then to professional journalists who, well, they have the resources at hand to look into those stories and to analyze those stories to a deeper level. That's their role. So the question really is just to finish now.
how can you facilitate that collaboration between professional people and campaigners or those who do work on a voluntary basis. And tonight was of assistance as well, a lot of people meeting for the first time in this room and opportunities such as that provided tonight give us an opportunity to meet people from across the various sectors. So I'd welcome any questions or comments that you'd like to make. I just wanted to ask in terms of data, you talked about sharing data, is anyone developing something like they work for you here in Wales? I've signed up to updates from Westminster, from some MPs from my area, and that's a really good way of being, you can put in keywords to access to and get emails based on that information so that we and assembly members can communicate more effectively with people. If there were subjects that were of interest to people, they could then sign up to that system. And the second question is, what are the councillors in England that you talk about who are far more interesting than us in terms of what we do in the assembly? What are they doing? I'm going to answer the second question first. Well, I can introduce you to the person who made that comment, but they were talk about Cardiff councillors mainly. Personally, I felt that the councillors provided a better model in terms of engagement with some member members. That's what that person said. I'm just um, reporting what they said. So, so, but what is true? What is certainly true is that. We are looking at. We were looking at examples of that. Whether there is sufficient flow of information between AMs and councillors and their staff, because every assembly member has a civil, is a civil servant really who is accountable to the public really. So we're sharing lessons here. Does that answer your question? I hope so. And also in terms of they work for you. Our Parliament, or our, the Senate, or the Assembly is the only one that is not on that database. The, that Scotland, Northern Ireland, and the UK Parliament is on. They work for you, but because or well, one of the problems was the format of the data that the Assembly actually uses to publish the record of proceedings and documents of that kind, and there's questions of license. I think copyright licenses is relevant as well, but hopefully it will now be easier to interpret that information, to feed things into things such as they work for you, rather than an untidy format that they have set out, a more consistent format now. And anyone is welcome to help. They work for you as a project under my society. And they, one of the biggest or most innovative organizations in terms of using digital media and so on. So anyone in the room is welcome to work with them. Or, or the assembly could talk to them to facilitate the flow of information or data, not only with regard to the record of proceedings, but there are also other documents such as policy documents and reports. I'm, I'm sure that there's a wealth of resources out there that come out from, that emanate from research and so on. So better use of existing data would be excellent in relation to what we are trying to achieve. My name is Robert Andrews. I'm a journalist covering the business of digital media. Um, so I think the problem that the Assembly has identified is, is um, how can it keep citizens engaged? And it seems to me that the debate so far has sort of centred around um, helping others to do that on its behalf. Um, I guess principally through two classes of correspondent. On the one hand, big media, which we know is a, an industry in recession. So. That is a fragile prospect for big media continuing to communicate the business of the assembly. And then grassroots people, many of whom are here tonight and I have a lot of respect for, but um, the business models of which are 
slim and often based on grant funding. So that's um, a fragile prospect as well. So I think we can say that you know neither of those opportunities are really solid bases going forward to, to go on and communicate the business of the assembly. Um, in digital media, there's this adage now, nowadays that any company can be a media company. And principally, that comes from marketing. Um, uh, marketers are very excited about the new, new opportunities that um, me digital media allow to communicate for themselves and not to have that be mediated. Um, so I think that the assembly need not rely wholly on having its business, its communication mediated by third parties. Um, so there are opportunities to use existing third, third party platforms like we've talked about the social networks um, or even to build a platform to do, to do that job. Um, it might not be very fashionable to say or to recommend that a government should build its own big IT infrastructure or platform. Often those things go horribly wrong. Um, but when you look at what the likes of gov.uk have done um, on static information, distilling the essence of what, what government does down and communicating that effectively, and then on, on rolling information, when you look at the things that the likes of They Work For You have done, um, the, the My Society guys, um, doing excellent work on turning the business of, of a political institution into really accessible information. Um, it's great, and I think it, it's embarrassing that the, the business of the Assembly still isn't on. They work for you after so many years. Um, so when it comes to council papers, or just going with this idea that any company can be a media company, um, I believe that it's not just the... Not, I, don't, I believe it's... It's not just, I think it's the duty of councils to communicate to, to citizens the business of what those councils are up to. Um, I think that all those citizens ha have a right to know that. So this is an idea of government as a, as a service, government as a platform. If the, if, if the assembly made its records, made all of its business available in a very accessible platform, if there was a, if there was a way for me as a citizen to subscribe to the information, everything that my elected member is doing, all of the stuff that's going on in my local community, and made it fresh and interesting and live and exciting, that I would value that. I think citizens would, would value that if it was a platform provided by the assembly as, as, um, as an agnostic service provider, if you like, not even a platform provided by an assembly member. Um, so this, we needn't get bogged down and be scared by the earlier talk, for example, of the assembly becoming a news, a, a media owner. This is not, this is not the assembly buying the Western Mail. Um, and, and, you know, nor would being a platform operator diminish journalists' ability to go on and do their own investigations, as you said, perhaps using some of that data. So I just wanted to float out there what I think is possibly a controversial notion, but but provide a very accessible platform straight from the horse's mouth. Um, I've just got a couple of little points to make, really, and they're more of information. But uh, yesterday there was a conference in Cardiff called the OI Conference, um, set up by Tony Dowling, who has just taken over the South Wales uh, Evening Post. And there was about 200 people there. Uh, and one of the themes was... Uh, Power and control tend to be culture within institutions and big businesses, or some of them, and that the culture of the internet is about influence and impact. And that, I think, is something that really has to be, um, you know, analysed in terms of this, because people don't want media online that is about power and control. Nobody likes it. And the other thing is just a little point of information of a project that I'm involved in, which I'm really proud about, and which is actually funded by the Welsh Government, and it's called the FYI Network, and we are attempting to investigate how digital means can help with economic regeneration. So we're in Neath at the moment, and we're going to Brecon, Crickhowell, and Talgarth, uh, and we are an internet team. We don't have any journalists, but we do have content creators. And we do what the people in the town ask us to do. So we've just made a bride's guide to Neath, uh, which ran as a series for a couple of weeks on Facebook and on our site. And we're now making that into a multimedia online book, which will be video, text, and images. And um, people have found this so interesting in the digital world that four weeks ago we went to Facebook to talk about it. And a couple of hundred of 
cool London Gujarati listen to this, our story and what we're measuring and the progress. So I just thought you'd like to know about that and that there is something, you know, um, I think quite exciting going on in Wales. Hello everyone, uh, I'm David Melding, I'm the Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm afraid I was in uh, the Assembly chairing proceedings until 6.30, so I've only been here the last 40, 45 minutes. But I have to say, uh, hearing the, uh, the, the various groups uh, report back has, has been fascinating, I think full of ideas, a lot of challenging, the last one I thought very interesting indeed, uh, or the last couple rather, uh, in terms of what the Assembly could do for, I, there's almost engagement really rather than uh, urging others to think we're relevant uh, enough to write about. But I have to say this afternoon's debates, uh, one was on cancer services, I think that would interest everyone, uh, transport, particularly integrated uh, transport and uh, apprenticeships uh, and then uh, we had a short debate on hospital reconfiguration. I know all those subjects are absolutely at the heart of not only the, the, you know, Wales as a whole, but also local communities. So I, I think we've got to do something. I'm told newspapers were invented in the uh, English Civil War. It's called the English Civil War. It affected us all, but anyway. Uh, and uh, quite an elite uh, thing for a, a couple of centuries. And then in the mid-19th century, uh, you know, uh, literacy and uh, the availability of cheap newsprint and technology to use it transformed uh, uh, what newspapers are capable of doing. And I, I suppose with the digital revolution, we've not quite worked out how organizations or institutions like the Assembly can have a direct contact with citizens and engagement. But I, I think we're working towards some interesting um, suggestions that need to be tried out. And uh, we need to remodel the way we work and really look at uh, all the things we do. Someone just talked about the record of proceedings. You know, Hansard used to be the only record you'd ever have of Parliament. Our legal record actually now is not the record of proceedings. It is the audio tape. Uh, that's what would probably get used in a court of law if there was ever a dispute. So, you know, times change and we need to change with them. And of course, you're dealing with lots of people like me in their 50s who are, were not really that adept at change. But I'm glad to say you've got people like Bethan here, who is a great tweeter. Mark Isherwood also, I apologize, there may have been other AMs here earlier, but I, it's just ever so encouraging to see uh, AMs engaging in this sort of work as well. So we don't know the answers yet, but there are some, I think, intimations of, of what could really, really work, but a lot of it will be to have the courage to reshape and take advantage of the opportunity of uh, new forms of participation and reportage as well. I think that would be very much part of it. Um, anyway, in the Assembly, we're particularly grateful for all the, of you who have come along and uh, have given of your, your time and intellect this evening, particularly to the facilitators who have uh, made the whole thing work and uh, reported back. I look forward to getting a full report. Uh, it will be combined with the other seminar we had on... Uh, uh, sort of more than sort of the national or um, uh, UK press, rather, and, and how they uh, look at the assembly. Uh, but I think there's more grounds for hope. I did attend the other one uh, 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 for, the, for nearly the whole event, but uh, I, I've heard more things of interest and more signs of hope in the last 40 minutes than uh, I've probably picked up in that seminar. And that one wasn't unproductive, let me say that. Uh, that, that was very useful, some of the things. Uh, they were saying. Anyway, I can't say it's a wonderful night. My uh, Divlas, Heno, and Fodis. But so you're not going to go off to your garden and a nice glass of white wine. But I'm sure you've got other things to do, uh, even as you battle through the rain to get home. But many thanks and a safe journey. Hoyle. Uh,